Hi, my name is Randy Cohen. I'm a professor at Harvard Business School. Um, I study finance and entrepreneurship, and I'm here today to talk about quantitative analysis, as well as other forms of trying to predict returns in markets, especially stock markets. Well, uh, with quantitative analysis, what we do is we take uh, various factors that relate to the performance of companies uh, in the stock market. And we say, we like to buy stocks that have uh, positive exposure to factors that we believe generally are uh, associated with good returns. Um, and there's a set of quantitative factors. So, so every quant has his own proprietary uh, model uh, of uh, how to beat the stock market, right? And, uh, but there are certain factors that tend to show up in lots and lots of quant models when it comes to stocks. Uh, because they're, uh, they've sort of you know, shown a lot of robustness um, in the past. will do work uh, and they will show that a particular kind of stock tends to outperform. So for example, they might show that small companies have higher average returns than large companies. Um, so then uh, the next thing you'd want to do is to say, well, can that easily be explained by risk? Right? Might it be the case that small companies are just riskier than big companies and that the extra performance is just a reward for that risk? After all, stocks outperform bonds, but the fact that stocks outperform bonds historically is not generally viewed as some kind of great you know, market inefficiency or opportunity. The view is, yeah, bonds have lower average returns, but they have lower average risk. And so, therefore, uh, you, you know, can uh, form your portfolio recognizing that risk-return trade-off. Maybe small stocks are more like stocks in this analogy, and big stocks are more more like bonds that they are uh, you know, safer and therefore have lower expected returns. So then there are various ways that you can attempt to control for risk, um, of which the best known is the capital asset pricing model and, and its uh, risk measure called beta, uh, and you make those adjustments. And, and some people say, no, 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 we need uh, other models that take account of more different forms of risk. And let's say that after doing that, you concluded, hmm, even after adjusting for risk, it looks to us as though small companies uh, have higher average performance. Uh, value is the second factor. Um, there are a number of different value metrics you can use. I mentioned low P-E ratio being value companies. And again, the idea there is it's not just that the company's small, it's that um, uh, it seems like whatever amount of earnings the company has, you're sort of uh, purchasing those earnings for a low price, right? One company, you might have to pay $8 for every dollar of earnings. Another company, you might pay $50 for every dollar of earnings. Uh, and you might feel like, boy, if I can get a dollar of earnings for only $8, that sounds like a bargain. Those are bargain stocks. And you might think that they would perform better. Now, why isn't it obviously a bargain? Well, of course, companies where you have to pay $50 for every dollar of earnings, those are companies that have tremendous growth or tremendous growth expectations. So, you know, a company that has a very high uh, multiple of price to earnings right now, as I'm speaking, is Tesla Motors, which recently announced positive earnings, but, you know, still a very small fraction of uh, the total value of the company. Okay, so um, historically, what it turns out is that low multiple stocks do in fact perform better than high multiple stocks. So those bargain prices do really seem to be bargains, although it should be said that, uh, and uh, this, is, this comes from some research I'd done myself, um, something like 80 or 85% of the higher price of growth stocks is due to the fact that they are just gonna have their earnings grow so much in the future. But there is a little piece of 15 or 20% of that extra price you're paying for, for exciting growth companies that seems to be an overpay relative to expected, uh, you know, re relative to expectations. And so it does appear that you do in fact get somewhat better performance if you buy the stocks with low multiples. So that's, uh, we call that value. Uh, now, the word value is used a lot of different ways by different people. In particular, famously, sort of uh, Warren Buffett uh, tends to use the term value to refer more to companies with high and stable earnings, you know, uh, uh, you know, sort of, you know, really well-run, high-quality companies. Famously, you know, companies like Coca-Cola or Walmart or whatever have been uh, described uh, in this way as value companies. That's not how we professors use the word, but words are just words. Uh, uh, in the quant world, there's a tendency to, to refer uh, to those kinds of highly profitable uh, and stable, well-run companies as quality uh, companies. And, um, and the, the uh, alternative uh, is sometimes uh, kind of jokingly called junk stocks. Um, quality tends to outperform junk. 
Okay, so uh, so that's a third. Um, that's a third signal that people like to have in their quant models. They like to be pro quality. Another important factor is momentum. Now, momentum is kind of strange because it seems a little opposite to value. Uh, momentum stocks are companies that have done well uh, typically over the past six to 12 months. Um, and so uh, those companies tend to perform well uh, in the future. Okay. Now, there's an odd aspect of momentum, which is in general, it seems the companies that have performed well in the last month do not do very well. So momentum stocks tend to be stocks that have done well in the past six or 12 months, but not so much last month, and we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, and so um, uh, there's uh, price momentum, which is just about the stock price going up. There's also something called earnings momentum, which is uh, stocks that have had good earnings tend to do well. Uh, and um, now price momentum is an interesting signal in that it's uh, historically the average returns of high price momentum stocks, stocks that have performed well recently, uh, is much, much higher than stocks that have performed poorly recently. It's quite a large effect. Is, uh, is low beta or low volatility or low risk stocks. So um, uh, the quants will argue that stocks that are the low risk stocks that have very little market sensitivity and just in general have low volatility. Historically, some people claim those stocks actually outperform the market when obviously you would think they should underperform the market given that they're less risky. Some people say, well, they don't outperform the market, but they don't perform a lot worse than the market and the risk is much lower. So in other words, the way to think of this is imagine a portfolio that's half stock, half bonds, right? And how well you're going to do on that. And now imagine a portfolio where it's all stocks, but they're very low risk companies. That second portfolio might not be any riskier than the one that's half stock, half bonds, because even though you don't have any bonds in the second portfolio, you're invested in, in safe companies, right? Think of utilities and other companies. And risk-wise, you might not have been significantly riskier than the half stock, half bond portfolio. So low beta is another important quantitative factor. Because my view of, of quant is this. You have two sources of um, information about a signal and whether uh, it should work to predict market returns. One is, historically, has it worked? And the other is, do we have a compelling reason why it should work, right? In my feeling, the reason I like quant so much compared to, for example, technical, is I really want both. For me to truly believe in something like uh, the value effect or the low beta effect, I need to feel that not only historically has it worked, but also I think um, that there's a good reason why I think it should work and should continue to work. And if I feel like I understand it, and then I've also got the data on my side, that seems like a powerful combination to me.